Okay, um, thank you everyone for those really interesting presentations. Um, I think it's really important to emphasise that Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels has not been operating in a bubble for the past five years and there's a lot of other really important work going on around us and, you know, together we're all saving the UK's red squirrels. Um, so we've got quite a few questions from the audience and um, there seems to be kind of two main themes, I would say, which is... Um, Hi, Martins and volunteering. Um, so we'll try and cover both of those. What I will do first is I'm going to ask the top rated question, which I think probably any of you could answer, which is um, on the subject of um, increased tree planting, which is linked to ameliorating climate change, uh, resulting in the removal of non-native conifers and increasing planting of native broadleaf woodland. And the question is, how can we do that in such a way as to reduce impacts on red squirrels as much as possible if they're using those coniferous woodlands as refuges? So I don't know who would want to maybe have a go at that first. Um, maybe Alan? Yeah, I'm sure, Jill, I think that's about um, remembering that mixed woodlands are also can be a natural part of our landscape and that, uh, that makes great squirrel habitat. Um, and, and actually our, you know, and some conifer plantation, I think, will remain, I think for most people agree, you need to be part of our kind of mix for short-term carbon sequestration. So I, I, I guess my short-term answer, that my quick answer to that would be a kind of a tapering in one to one as we look to go more native, building native conifer, building pine into that future, but I think also we'll be retaining productive timber going forward if we can. And also I think slowing down, you know, kind of changing silvicultural methods will make more sensitive car for plantation management as well. So low impact silviculture, less clear fell, this dramatic change in the wooden landscape that will all, that gives um, squirrels more room to move around. I guess that was really interesting what Katie was saying there about the model of connectivity in Northern Ireland. And um, I think that's that's a key thing. So more woodland in general should be, should be good news for squirrels. Yeah, um, Katie, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> No, I think, um, yeah, we have very little woodland cover in Northern Ireland, you know, so anything, obviously, we all know we need to make sure trees are in the right place and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, if there's good native woodland there, that's good for red squirrels, you know, they, they, they can use that. So it's not like we can't just say that they just have to rely on plantation forestry. They're in that because there's nothing else, you know. So we need to um, make sure there is a bit of a balance, but definitely not, you know, if there's a red squirrel population that's only surviving on that little fragment of forest, you know, we can't cut that down. And so it is a bit of a difficult one. I think it's case by case, really. But we also need to be aware that red squirrels can move over other little things in, in the landscape, like big, healthy hedgerows. You know, red squirrels can use to commute over and things like that um, really benefit a load of other wildlife as well. So we just need to think about corridors um, as well as woodland planting. And Heinz, do you have any different perspective from Northern England? Uh, I was offline. I missed the question. Oh, OK. Um, I think we were just asking about um, the... Um, the whole idea of removing non-native coniferous woodland and replacing it with a uh, native broadleaf and how that could affect red squirrel conservation. Yes, obviously, um, as Alan was saying, there's a co commercial element to conifer forest and um, that's unavoidable. unavoidable. We, we have to appreciate the, the commercial interest there is in forestry and it's creating habitat. But yes, of course, there is a desire to move towards native trees and um, so that's slowly, slowly happening. You can see the incentives provided through planting grants is, in, is, is encouraging landowners to incorporate a proportion of uh, um, broadleaf trees in that. And then there's also the, de the debate about uh, facilitating grey incursion. And I think that's a debate we're, we're having. Do we totally uh, place a monitorium on oaks, hazels uh, and so on? My feeling is we're getting to a place where we can um, move away from that, especially in view of uh, fertility control in the future. Uh, Grays will be any less of a problem, and, and maybe those species do, the black oak and hazel can come, start coming back. I would like to see that. OK, 
Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, I'll go into some questions about volunteering now. So um, I think this is another one for you, Heinz. Um, someone has been asking, how would you describe the typical like profile or range of one of your volunteers and how can you best engage with those people? It's it's um, it's very difficult to say. Generally speaking, volunteers tend to be people who have uh, more time on their hands. Um, so it really depends on how busy people are. We're all busy working lives, but re retired people tend to have more time on their hands and can help. But there is a variety of people involved in, in conservation volunteering, from students to people. I know uh, volunteers from a group on the East Coast Many of the volunteers in that group are working people, but just very keen to participate in conserving red squirrels. So you have really have a variety of people. How do you engage with them? I do think that engaging with uh, and recruiting new volunteers needs to be driven from a local community group level. Um, my desire is to help local groups to equip them with the necessary skills and and tools so that they can go out and do talks and raise awareness and, and get people involved and interested uh, and hopefully we can do a little bit more of that in the future great okay and then i can another question about volunteering for katie which is asking um so the volunteer groups that you've got in northern ireland what kind of support does um ulster wildlife give to those groups is it similar to what we do here in scotland yeah, so um, through the Red Squirrels United project, there was we had a big push then to to kind of making sure groups were set up. There was a lot of new groups set up then, and things like you know making sure they had insurance in place, making sure they had the right operating licenses to go into forest service sites, and um, making sure that um, anyone that was involved in grey squirrel control had the right training and went through the Lantra course. And then obviously Ulster Wildlife has quite a big, you know, membership. So we would um, publicise their events and, and everything like that. I think um, what we want and what those groups want is to kind of be standalone. So we're trying to get them to that point where they're like self-sufficient, you know, and then um, at the minute, again, as I said, we have two new groups. So we're kind of doing that process over again with them. And it's just really some of them want more support and some of them want less. You know, it just depends and we kind of there you know they can come to us and, and and we can provide what we're able to basically and um, from our end so yeah yeah and i think it, it's kind of similar in northern england times i mean a lot of your groups have been running for for quite a long time is that right yeah yeah there's there's a whole range of different groups um some well established uh, some as long as three decades who uh, employ rangers and deploy them and have a very thriving fundraising campaign themselves. Um, and then you've got very small groups, um, but yeah, generally speaking, quite long-term, long-established groups and functioning really well. And hence, that's why 86% of the effort as far as grey management concerned is uh, delivered by those local community groups. So without them, you know, we'd be in a very precarious uh, position as far as red schools are concerned. Mm, yeah, that, that's the same. Oh, sorry. To, that's the no. same in Northern Ireland, really. We don't have a percentage yet, but we, we'd like to try and work that out. But um, because, we, you know, we, we're a charity and we, through RSU, we had lots of staff working on the ground, but, you know, that funded ended and now we don't. Um, and all of that great score control is done on the ground is done by the volunteers which is just just amazing and yeah we wouldn't be able to do any of that without them and then kind of on that um kind of someone know um someone is asking i think this was for you again heinz um do you ever shoot in urban or semi-urban areas and if so how is that possible no i don't think that is feasible at this stage not at least as far as i'm aware that that's not um the practice um a lot of the work is done uh, in urban places uh in, in uh i can think of an example in the southeast coast of uh, northumberland where there's a, a thriving uh, a local red school group and you know it's urban lots of houses around and the primarily uh, operate through uh, monitoring and then responsibly trapping when greys are detected 
but shooting in that sort of context is not really feasible. That's more for the countryside. Um, gen that's just generally speaking, I'm sure there might be uh, exceptions, but that's my uh, observation. Sure. Okay, I think I better ask some of these Pine Martin questions because there's a few of them. Um, so one here for uh, Katie, I've got one here for you, which is um, someone saying it was interesting to see the red squirrels and Pine Martin so close together in the picture. Um, have you ever witnessed or gained anecdotal evidence um, of Pine Martin scat deterring reds? Hmm. Not, not really. Now, I know Emma's going to be talking about Pine Martin later and maybe she'll have more insight into this. And um, there's definitely something, you know, this relationship is definitely something we where there's a lot of people researching that we need to look into more. But we it, it's funny because the Fermanagh population seems to just, they've kind of coexisted for so long. We get the both present quite often in the same place. You know, we maybe find the reds are more, more cautious on the cameras when pine marks maybe haven't been there and they've just appeared in an area. Whereas this kind of population in the woodlands in Fermanagh, um, same, you know, quite often when we do the survey, you'll get pine martins and reds both on the cameras at similar times. We've kind of, we have seen the opposite where there's one area we monitor where there's a pine martin, a family of pine martins, and there's only greys there. And we've seen the greys not bothered at all by um, pine martins. And we've even got footage of a pine martin predating a grey in the feeder, like at the feeder, um, which was just, uh, you know, amazing to see. So, um, but I think the more and more we find out about this relationship, um, the better, because it's just, it's so interesting. Yeah, and someone else is asking, so is, is Pine Martin monitoring and support part of your long-term strategy? Yeah, 100%. We really think that um, we want to bring in Pine Martin more to our work because you can't really look at red squirrel conservation now without including Pine Martins in that. So really we are focusing on the three species as a whole. And I think, um, yeah, it's really important for us to to keep on monitoring um, pine martens to so include the three species, and we'll be doing that every other year, basically going forward across the whole country. Cool. I've got two th quite similar questions, one for you again, Kate, one for Alan, so we'll go to Alan first. So someone is asking, um, do you have any evidence that red squirrels released into sites with pine martens show decreased survival? Don't, no, um, and probably a number of the sites that we've put them into have got martins present and um, we see signs of natural feeding within a fortnight um, as, and I think I said in my presentation, you know, breeding within a few months, the next breeding season. So an expansion as well. So with there's habitat available, they, they fill it. So um, no, certainly no, nothing to make us, make us think that. Mm. And then uh, similar for yourself, Katie, someone's asking, you know, if, if reds are somewhere where they've got fragmented habitat and reduced habitat quality and competition from greys, someone's saying, is pine martens, could that be the final straw for them if they were also in the area? Yeah, I mean, that's a difficult one to answer, isn't it? And um, I think we're not quite sure yet. I, I would say that a lot of the red squirrel groups that um, in the east of the country that don't have pine martens yet are worried about that. Um, you know, and we kind of just have to, to keep going with that. I think really we have such small densities of the pine martens in the east that we're, we're hoping that that impact, you know, they won't have that great an impact yet, but we just don't know. We obviously, we've seen that we need a certain density. There has to be a high density of pine martens to make any impact on the grey squirrel population. But we're just not sure. We're kind of just keeping a watch on that and saying we really hope not but that kind of also shows us how much that um we need to protect those little fragments and that we really need to work on habitat connectivity and give them space to move out and not just basically rely on those because there's going to be genetic issues all sorts of issues with those little small populations we have left okay thanks um, someone is asking, again, this is a general question, um, what protection legally is there for red squirrels? Um, as I was saying, places where red squirrels have been seen have been clear felled in our area. Um, what is the landowner's responsibility? And I guess this will probably depend on the different countries. I don't know how much it changes. I mean, Alan, do you know much about it in Scotland? 
a wee bit well know that you you shouldn't be clear filling in the if you see signs of drays being occupied it's it's a really simple thing but it is i think regularly well a not clocked and b if it is clocked ignored just the you know that's just the nature of forestry or forestry business mm -hmm. and um, do what is it different in england how does it compare to scotland times um, yes, an interesting question. As far as the law and um, guidance goes at the moment, it's basically, uh, the, uh, practically speaking, if there's a dray in a tree and there's a clear felling operation, uh, operators should be felling in a direction to facilitate uh, an escape route for uh, red squirrels. Any trees with drays in must be marked and uh, retained, as well as two or three halo trees around it. Um, now, I'm just explaining what the practice in the law is. I'm not saying I, I agree with this um, protocol. Um, we, we're currently in dialogue uh, in, a, in a working group with Forestry Commission, along with other partners from other organizations, discussing and drawing up guidance um, to, to help inform foresters what to do. But essentially, that's where the law stands at the moment. It's not ideal. Um, because especially because there's no restriction as to going ahead with that sort of operation during the breeding season um which which is definitely not ideal but that's where we are at at the moment and we're trying to influence uh, uh through these discussions the um, forestry commission to look at the practice it might require a change in the law in the future. I know Craig Shuttleworth is working with authorities in uh, Wales to try and do that right now. So we're interested to see how that goes. And any different perspectives, Katie? Um, no, it's just yeah, the same rules basically based as Scotland, I think. Um, and yeah, if there's a dray, you're not allowed to cut the tree down. But yes, I agree. I agree with Heinz um, and everything he said there that you know it sh should really be looked into we need to some way of moving forward and working with the forestry companies on it okay great uh, i've got another question here for alan um do you think expanding riparian woodland ranges would increase corridors for reds yeah <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> simple <laughs> as that <laughs> um and actually that kind of links on to a question that i had for you which was um do you get, what's your kind of long-term vision for this? Do you imagine all those populations um, in the Northwest reconnecting with the main population of the Highlands? I, I'm not sure we envisage that. I mean, that would be great. Um, but uh, I'm not sure the connectivity is there. There's a lot of high ground in between and um, it's a long way. I guess there are also issues to consider about if those connections do arrive to graze make use of it as well. And does that spread that issue? further north over time. But certainly we are looking at trying to get to Becky next year when she's back, she'll look at the north of Scotland, the very north of Scotland, so it's either locations up there that are viable for releases. It would be great to fill in that range as well, and just kind of add to these kind of secure refuges. For now, that's, that's the priority for now. Great, okay, thank you. Um, and then also, one for you, Heinz, um, saying it's fantastic to see the work being done in Northern England. How secure is the future of Northern England Reds and what are the long term aims? Um, I, I was just reflecting on that myself recently and just thinking, um, um, following a meeting, discussing this. And I really feel very optimistic about Red Scrolls in Northern England. Um, where we were a decade or two decades ago, and where we are now is a very different place. Yes, there's still a significant uh, threat from gray squirrels continuing to uh, in incursion back into where they've been cleared from. But there's so many volunteer, community volunteer groups involved in, in working really hard, significant effort that's holding that line. And um, I think we'll be hearing later from um, Kay Hall from the UK Squirrel Court about the, the progress as far as fertility control research is concerned and I do think that's going to be a game changer and it's not that far away um, for, so in the meantime for the next five years or so I think we need to hold the line um, consolidate our effort work together uh, and hold that line but what I'm seeing you know looking at uh, red school range from the data from everybody 
it's really amazing what's happening in the north of England that reds are starting to appear everywhere, which is really encouraging. Okay, great. Um, I think there's a few more there, but I feel like we've probably been talking for quite a long time. I think that was quite a nice place to end it, actually. So um, thank you very much, everybody. That was a really interesting conversation. And I'll just say to everyone watching on Crowdcoms, you know, if you do have another question and um, you want to ask it, please do get in touch with the speakers individually. Um, they should all be, if you go to the left hand um, bar, you can see a list of all the speakers and you can get their contact details. You can send them a message through the app or you can get their email, um, just whatever you prefer. Um, so now we're going to just take a break and we'll be back for the next session at 20 past two, which is about um, science and research, which is going on across the UK. So um, we'll see you all back for that at 20 past two.